This is the SF Productions Podcast Network. He's the man with the golden gut. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. You can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics on iTunes, or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. So as summer runs out, we can look forward (laughs) to new fall TV shows. With all the choices and options today, fall premieres are becoming an antiquated concept, really. Yes. Just like the reason they were created, which was to sell new cars, because back then, that's when all the new cars came out. Now, all at once, which doesn't happen. Yeah. But back in the 1970s, you only really had three choices. ABC, NBC, CBS. It was a lot easier. Absolutely. And one man led all three networks. Not at the same time. No. Saving two and almost bankrupting the other, Fred Silverman. He was known as the man with a golden gut for his unerring ability to greenlight hit shows. Yes. (laughs) He started in TV at Chicago's WGN in 1959 after working in the mailroom at ABC. Do they even have mailrooms anymore? No, I'm sure they don't. His master's thesis from THE Ohio State University on ABC programming over 10 years got him noticed at CBS, where he took over daytime programming. Now, TV at the time was handled in day parts. Morning, afternoon, evening, late night. This was way before syndication really oh, happened. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So keep in mind that at least when he was with the networks, he didn't actually produce shows, mm-hmm. but he greenlit them and actually helped to create them. So he had an enormous impact on what made it to pilots. Mm-hmm. In 1969, again, at this point, he is daytime programming, which mm-hmm. includes Saturday morning. Okay. So he greenlit Scooby-Doo for Saturday morning, and, in fact, the Fred Jones character in Scooby-Doo is named for Fred Silverman. Mm-hmm. He was given control of all programming at CBS in 1970 and then led the infamous Rural Purge. So, goodbye, Petticoat Junction. Yes. The idea was that CBS was number one in the ratings, but demographers came in and sold them and advertisers on the idea that you needed the right people, not just the most people, watching your shows. Mm -hmm. So CBS viewers were older and more rural, so they weren't good for the advertisers. Because they didn't have as much money to spend? And they were older, so they were less pliable in terms of changing They were more set in their ways. Right. So Silverman canceled in quick order Green Acres, Mayberry RFD, Hee Haw, Beverly Hillbillies, Lassie, Family Affair, My Three Sons, and Hogan's Heroes. Not sure how that got in there. Well, Family Affair doesn't really fit with the whole rural thing either. No, no. So this opened up so many spots all at once that they were forced at CBS to take chances on some new concepts for shows. Those shows were... All in the Family, MASH, and the Mary Tyler Moore Show, all of which revitalized the network. And were arguably much better shows and more socially relevant shows than what was canceled. Right, but they were a little more risky than what they were doing at the time. Silverman was a big fan of spinoffs. He was the one who really popularized the spinoff idea. So at CBS we got Maud, The Jeffersons, and Good Times, all of which came from All in the Family, And Rhoda and Phyllis both came from Mary Tyler Moore Show. Mm -hmm. Actually, the Bob Newhart Show really almost fits in as a spinoff because it was the same writing team as the Mary Tyler Moore Show. Right. Silverman also brought back game shows to daytime after they had disappeared in the late 60s. After the scandal? Well, this was was long after the scandal, but they just kind of faded away in the late 60s. So he resurrected a show called The Price is Right, which had done... Fairly well for years. Bill Cullen. With Bill Cullen. And of course, that's The Price is Right that's still running over 40 years later. Yeah. Silverman also ended the practice of recycling old videotapes. Now, so much of what we know as 60s television is only around because of the filmed shows. The ones that were videotaped were mostly lost because it was cheaper to record over those shows. To take the same tape and just record over it. 
Did he ever say why he ended that? Did he say he wanted to keep the old shows? He, or? he, he wanted to, he thought there would be a use for him. He was, he, he somehow saw in the future wow. there would be a need. Yeah. But nobody else saw. I was like, ah, forget that. You know, then we got to store him. Eh. <laughs> Boy. Yeah. So in 1975, he was lured over to ABC with a big paycheck. ABC had been the number three network since its inception in the 50s, partly due to a moratorium on new stations in the early 50s when they were trying to figure out the, how color TV was going to work. Mm -hmm. The FCC said no more uh, 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 new uh, licenses for stations. And since NBC and CBS already were in there... And they had wrapped up those stations. Then they were exclusive for like two years, and that was a, that was a, a, a crucial two years. ABC was always behind. So Silverman took this show that was failing called Happy Days and turned it into a juggernaut. Yes. It launched multiple spinoffs. <laughs> Again, more spinoffs. Laverne and Shirley, Mork and Mindy, uh, Joni Loves Chachi. Which wasn't quite so popular. Right, but... <laughs> Ironically, Happy Days was losing to another spinoff, Good Times, over on CBS that Silverman had brought put mm -hmm. into place. <laughs> Silverman also began what was called Jiggle TV. <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah, women in skimpy outfits. <laughs> so that's where we we saw Charlie's Angels and Love Boat and Fantasy Island and Bionic Woman and the Battle of the Network Stars. <laughs> so. You got to look at this point in the history of television. At the time, you weren't even allowed to mention other networks' names. If you were a star on, say, an ABC show and you went on Johnny Carson, Johnny would say the show was on another network. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot easier than now if you say it's on another network. You yeah. would never be able to find it. Exactly. So the idea of Battle of the Network Stars is that a group of TV stars who are in uh, in teams representing their networks, so they actually had like logo, CBS or ABC or NBC logos in events such as tug of war, swimming, obstacle courses, with Howard Cosell doing the play-by-play. -play. There was no Entertainment Tonight. There was no internet, obviously. There was no TMZ. Yes. So this was the first time we had seen these stars warts at all. We either saw yeah. them in character on their show. Or on a talk show that was all very much pre-programmed right. as to what they were going to say. Yeah. I really doubt agents would ever allow this today. Yeah. That's why you'll <laughs> never see Battle of the Network Stars again. Oh, and apparently there was a no bra rule for the gals. <laughs> well, because otherwise it wouldn't have been, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. In ABC Daytime... Silverman put a new producer, Gloria Monty, in charge of, of a failing sit, uh, soap opera named General Hospital and gave her 13 weeks to fix it. It's still on the air. Yes. <laughs> he was good at picking people. Yeah. He also borrowed a local morning TV show concept and created Good Morning America. Under his reign, ABC went to number one for the first time ever. And then in 1978, Silverman attempted the trifecta, and he moved to NBC. I'm going to save them now. At this point, it's unclear what happened. Maybe he lost his way. Maybe the other execs were afraid of questioning him. <laughs> but things got weird at this point. Silverman introduced some of the worst TV shows of all time at NBC. Hello, Larry, which was McLean Stevenson's triumphant return to television after MASH. Where he's the is actually a spinoff of another show called Different Strokes, uh -huh. and uh, he's like a DJ, uh, like a talk uh, uh, radio host with kids, and wackiness ensues. Didn't really work out. No, Pink Lady and Jeff. No, I remember <laughs> that. I you know, so, I think I watched that a few times. Yeah, so this comedian Jeff Altman and these two. Uh, this uh, Japanese pop duo named Pink Lady. Who, who spoke no English. Spoke as I no recall. English. Yes. That's, that's the operative point here. Did a variety show. The girls said all their, their speeches phonetically. Had no idea what they were saying. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard to do comedy when you have no idea what you're saying. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was 
Super Train. So this was their love boat knockoff. Now I really think Super Train <laughs> could work. <laughs> so a nuclear powered train that went across the country at incredible speed and it included of course like a hot tub car and a disco car and a <laughs> and it was very much love boat. Absolutely because there were like several storylines and there was Here's your conductor, and here's your porter, and here's your, you know. <laughs> yeah, but without the scenery. Without the scenery, yeah. <laughs> so to be fair, he also introduced, introduced at NBC Different Strokes, as I mentioned, Facts of Life, which is a spinoff of Different Strokes, Hill Street Blues, and he got a, a young David Letterman on the air in a morning show and then got him to agree to a holding deal after the morning show until they could figure out what to do with him, which was, of course, for him to do Late Night with David Letterman. Right, which... You know, which Dave just finished his run yeah. <laughs> decades and decades later. He also committed to shows that became Cheers and St. Elsewhere. He also promoted Brandon Tartikoff, soon to succeed him, and Tartikoff later created the must-see TV juggernaut of NBC in the mm -hmm. 80s and 90s. Silverman left the network in 1981 and started his own production company. Okay, so now he's no longer picking out the shows. He's, he's creating, just them. creating them. So some of the shows he created as an independent producer. Matlock, Jake and the Fat Man, Diagnosis Murder, Father Dialing Mysteries, and the Perry Mason TV movies. And he also created that terrible Thick of the Night, <laughs> Alan Thick. Uh, late night talk show fiasco. Yeah. <laughs> but regardless of that, his impact on TV cannot be overstated. No. <laughs> no. TV, is, if you watched 70s television, you watch something that, that Fred Silverman had his hand on. And all the point. people who are creating TV today watch that Fred Silverman era. era. And uh, there's a lot of influence on TV today from that. So no question. Um, while you're not watching TV, though, you can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics, on iTunes or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. Thanks for watching. And I'm off to watch Battle of the Network Stars! <laughs> <laughs>